There are different channels. You can keep that near you in case you want to, you know, you need to go. And I'll keep it over there for the echo. And this is the receiver, so best thing, keep this on your left. Great. Left side. Cool. Can you guys hear me okay? Good in the back? Thumbs up? All right, awesome. Thanks. Hey, so uh, I'm going to turn this down. No, no, no. We, we got an active feedback camera. Cool. So it'll, it'll find the frequency and just knock it out. Great. All right, we'll talk softly. Yes? There we go. Okay. So this is a practical man in the middle and still testing the mic. Like I said, it's All right. System, so it'll, it'll take care of you. Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, you're, hopefully, you're in the right talk here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Cran. Um, I'm an advisor for the Source Conference, um, also CTO at Pony Express, also like sales guy at Pony Express, also like marketing guy at Pony Express, also whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, small company. It's cool. Uh, so, uh, before that, I was QA director at Metasploit, and then before that, penetration tester at uh, Rapid7. So, what are we going to talk about today? Um, I wish I could see this. It's uh, not good. Well, anyway, uh, man in the middle is a huge topic. Uh, it's actually one of those things where uh, I very quickly got overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that we can talk about uh, in this talk. And what I wanted to do is focus this a little bit and talk about um, you know man in the middle very specifically um, on certain types of attacks. Um, you know, one of those, one of the, one of the things. Obviously, the Pony Express influence here is, you know, local uh, man in the middle um, on a targeted network and on a local network, as opposed to SSL or or to like BGP attacks, right? Um, you know, that's just not that practical for a pen tester. So let's talk about that, um, and then we'll talk about sort of why why this stuff matters this year and why this stuff matters in general, um, and then we'll get into some practical attacks and some automation, um, and then we'll talk about some takeaways. So, um, you know, very quickly, I also, uh, you know, thought, well, maybe I'll spend some time doing some automation for this talk and work on, uh, you know, making things uh, super easy to use. But it turns out there's tons and tons of automation out there. There's people in this room, uh, Ryan Lynn over here, who's, who's uh, put together, like, some really awesome automation. And, and um, I didn't want to sort of duplicate some of the efforts that were already being made with Ettercap and with Beef and things like that. Um, so our focus today is going to be very specifically on the local network and the wireless network. Um, and then you know, more specific than that, getting in the middle. Um, and then from there, viewing and manipulating traffic and then automating some of the easy wins. What we're not going to focus on is you know, SSL, man in the middle, BGP, um, some of the more complex attacks spanning tree protocol, um, hot, hot swap routing protocol, um, or the, the man in the browser um, type, type uh, uh, man in the middle stuff. So we got it. All right, cool. Um, so, um, you know, I've always been enamored with this idea of, you know, how do we attack uh, folks, you know, directly around us? How do we target these things? Um, I was walking past a bank in New York one time, and I was looking in, and I saw uh, uh, a machine that was sitting there, and it's running Windows XP, and I'm like, I know I can own this machine, but how do I get to that? How do I actually access that box from standing out here, or even, you know, that specific box? Um, you know, and, and also, you know, uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. Um, how do you how do you sort of uh, determine what's around you um, in these these environments? Um, so the so the question is, you know, wh why do you care about local man in the middle? Hasn't ARP spoofing been around for 15 years? Um, you know, DNS spoofing, these sorts of things. These things aren't really that new. Um, so so why do we really care that much? Um, you know, and we go back to this this sort of idea of how do we you know sort of utilize what's around us um, to, to um, I, I guess, really, how, why, why do we care about ARP spoofing? Why is that a big deal? Um, there's a couple reasons. Um, you know, the, the trend is sort of toward wireless everywhere. Every device is, has a smartphone. Every, everybody has a smartphone. Everybody has wireless. Um, every smartphone on AT&T will automatically connect to the ATT. Uh, Wi-Fi network. Um, you know, networks are getting more accessible in a lot of ways. Um, you know, think about retail, think about point of sale. Um, you know, just being available. Um, you know, that you can access their network. Um, sometimes it is hard to take control of a particular uh, system. Um, sometimes the network is the easier target. 
Um, there's a couple things here. Um, how many people are familiar with our spoofing? Pretty much everybody. How many people are familiar with Slack? The Slack attack? Got one. A couple others. Okay, cool. All right, just trying to judge basically how I should spend my time uh, sort of talking about this stuff. Um, ARP, ARP cache poisoning is still a valid attack. Um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of mitigations. Um, in my testing, I've seen you know some networks, more enterprise actually uh, be vulnerable to it versus you know your sort of um, uh, airplanes, uh, hotels, things like that. There's often mitigations deployed there. Um, Slack um, is a stateless uh, auto configuration for IPv6. Um, and it was released uh, two years ago by a, by a gentleman at the InfoSec Institute. Um, and it's very, it operates in a very similar way, um, but for IPv6 and allows you to tunnel out over IPv4. So we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, as far as, uh, you know, again, why you should care, would your users really notice if they got an invalid cert? Probably not. Um, and, and evil twin attacks are, are sort of still pervasive. So. You know, um, all of these reasons are, are sort of bringing man in the middle back to a point where it's really relevant. Um, Android. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, there was a study done at the Leibniz University of Hanover um, where the guys analyzed 13,500 uh, 13, Android apps, found uh, about 1,000 of those vulnerable to um, no verification on the SSL certificate. Um, it's a pretty common developer bug um, to basically just specify SSL no verify. Um, I'm sure you've all run into this at some point um, where, yeah, it's using SSL, but the certificate can actually be uh, swapped out. Um, and so, you know, realistically, it's not, not um, verifying the communication between the points. And, um, you know, it's about the same as not having SSL. Um, okay, great. Another reason to care. ARM devices um, are getting smaller and smaller. You know, it kind of started out with the palm plug. Um, gum sticks have been very small. Uh, the Odroid devices, um, the SS808. This is a little uh, 1.7 gigahertz quad core. Um, it's about the size of, uh, you know, a half dollar or so. I'm sorry, a half a dollar, not a half dollar. Um, and it's ultimately fast enough to run most, most relevant, most current attacks. You know, similar similar board here. This is a uh, an MK, uh, sorry, an SS808 by SaneSmart. It's 50 bucks on Amazon. Um, you can literally go buy this board, drop Kali on it, um, and have a full attack platform for 50 bucks. Um, pretty crazy. This uh, so so basically, um, you know, just kind of building building more um, credibility for for why you should care about this. Um, Intel's projecting ubiquitous computing by 2020. Um, we'll see about that. Uh, but, but I mean, obviously the trend is toward smaller and smaller devices. Um, how many of you have seen an iPad in a store recently? A few of you? Everybody? Okay, cool. Yeah, how about this many iPads in the store? Um, or, you know, this sort of thing. Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, it, retail and point of sale is interesting just because you can sort of get access to the network there, whether it's, you know, a wired network or whether it's a wireless network. Now, I don't know if these things are securely configured, if there's a VPN connection back to headquarters with these, but somehow I doubt it in many cases. I mean, it's almost easier than doing this anymore. Like, why steal the cash register if you can just plug in a device? Um, also, um, you know, 4G speed's getting faster. Um, how many people have seen the Freedom Stick? One person, two people, three people. Uh, it basically, Freedom Sticks uh, a rebranding of Clear Wireless. Um, for two bucks a month, you can get 500 megs of uh, upload speed on 4G speeds. Pretty cool stuff. Um, if you get a chance, check it out. So, um, okay, that's all good and well. You know, the trend is toward mobile. Trend is toward uh, network everywhere. Um, but securing layer two is hard. Um, how many folks are actually getting owned by man in the middle? Um, and really, you know, is it is it that practical? Um, and you know, this talk is meant to be a practical talk. So let's kind of um, let's go through some of those attacks. So um, I sort of picked out a number of different things that I thought were really, really easy to automate and really, really easy to um, uh, you know attack. Um, and this is the list that I came up with. Um, 
So we'll go through each one of these piece by piece. Um, you know, the first thing to say sort of about man in the middle is the easiest way to prevent this thing is to have a strong VPN connection. If you're not actually encrypting your traffic from end to end, um, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to sort of get around it, even if you're using SSL. Um, how many people have used a throwing star tap? One, two. How many people have invented a throwing star tap? I see one. Uh, <laughs> These things are, they're awesome. They're uh, like 15, uh, 15 to $20. Um, you can buy them at a number of different places. Uh, Michael Osman here has uh, you know, created an easy way to get in line on the network. Um, you know, if you want to buy the, the professional kit, they're about $40. It's already built for you. You don't have to actually solder if you can't solder like myself. Um, sometimes it's better to just go with the pre-built. Um, these things are great. Um, what you see on the right, if you can see it in the back, is basically a throwing star tap. What you see on the left is a dual com uh, uh, port spanning uh, device. And so this is a great way to just get in the middle of a connection. Um, if you have a Dropbox, um, you can basically put it on the network, plug this guy in, um, and connect to it. And so you'll basically connect your network through the device, and then connect one of your devices off of it. Now it's not good if you want to manipulate traffic, but if you just want to see what's actually going on on the network, um, it's a great way to do it. Um, now you can do a similar thing with just uh, the uh, firewall, right? Or sorry, just a um, just a device. If you've got two interfaces, you can set up a bridge with bridge uh, bridge utils. Um, how many folks have used a Linux bridge before? Familiar with it? Pretty decent number. Um, this is basically all you have to do in order to set up a bridge on Linux. Um, use bridge control. Um, type add bridge and then add the interfaces you want to it. Um, and then at that point, um, you can basically route traffic through the device. Um, you know, great way to either manipulate it, uh, traffic, or just to get visibility into it. Um, you know, how do you prevent hardware attacks? Um, you know, good physical security is what it comes down to. Uh, ARP cache poisoning. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. Sorry for like bringing up like really old stuff, but it's so relevant that you know it's hard to avoid when you're talking about man in the middle. Basically, what's going on is that you're um, sending ARP traffic um, uh, to the broadcast address and, and or to your targets and telling them um, that you are at a particular IP address. Um, they will forward their traffic to you. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, you know, it's literally this easy to do. Um, there's lots of ways to do this, um, and so um, we won't spend a lot of time on it. What I did want to talk about a little bit, though, is you know how do you prevent ARP cache poisoning? It seems you know a lot of people talk about um, how to how to um, you know exploit it, but not a lot of people talk about sort of how to prevent it. And so um, I've noticed again in my testing that that you know in most hotels, most um, you know public places, I'm not actually able to ARP spoof. And why is that? Um, obviously, it's not because of static ARP tables, right? Um, Oftentimes, I think what it is actually, I think what's going on is that they've disabled gratuitous ARP. If you're sending a lot of ARP packets, they're not allowing you to, um, to basically um, send ARP packets anymore. Like they basically cut you off at that point. Um, interestingly, Huawei has a patented technique on this that they're not, um, they published, um, and you can find it, it's in the notes for this slide if you're interested in it. Um, you know, typically the guidance is to just monitor ARP and make sure that you're not. Um, you know, you're not seeing tons of ARP traffic. Um, how many people familiar with DNS cache poisoning? Cool. I was too, um, I, I guess I was confused sort of on DNS cache poisoning about, you know, how do you actually exploit this? Um, you know, there was, there was talk of the birthday attack, um, which is basically where you sort of guess the transmit ID from the um, DNS server. Um, you know, I'll actually give you a quick diagram, and sorry for the, the slide here, but basically what's happening is you've got a DNS server here, um, your authoritative server's here, your user's actually making your request here, um, and this is uh, you know, your malicious user. He's going and actually um, observing traffic coming from the resolver, and then um, you know, guessing the transmit ID. Um, and that transmit ID is relatively a small, it's a small number, so it's relatively easy to guess. Um, and what that allows them to do is spoof a response back to the user. The user gets either um, for their single domain a, an A record or they get um, you know, for, for the domain uh, uh, an authoritative record that allows you to um, 
basically um, set whatever DNS server you want. Um, it turns out um, the birthday attack really isn't that relevant anymore. Um, DNS server has been patched. Um, you know, the Kaminsky attack has really been patched in practice. Um, and so really the only way to do DNS cache poisoning, as far as I'm aware, is to actually be in the middle already. Um, and so you have to be observing traffic. Um, and you know, at that point, you can actually see what the transmit ID is and be able to return the response back to the host. Um, preventing DNS spoofing, DNSSEC is really the way to go. Okay, so the Slack attack. This one is actually like really, really interesting. Um, so provided by the InfoSec Institute about two years ago, I think in 2011, maybe 2012, um, what they observed was that um, most of the hosts on a network are already dual stacked. Um, so you can actually um, provide an IPv6 address to hosts using router advertisements, and they'll pick it up. So this is a typical uh, IPv4 internet, um, typical setup, right? So you've got your router here. Um, you've got hosts with IPv4 addresses. Uh, what the Slack attack is going to do is introduce a new router um, and give out IPv6 addresses to these devices. Um, XP, SP3 will actually pick up uh, uh, an IPv6 address, and anything above that will pick it up. Um, so, uh, let's skip ahead to this slide, and basically I'll walk you through the steps here. So, um, you know, this device here um, is actually going to get an IPv6 address. The evil router is going to do NAT PT translation on the device. And so you're going to have um, this requesting an IPv4 address. This is going to translate it to an IPv6 address, send it out to the server, or sorry, uh, go back. IPv6 address uh, comes to this server. This translates it to IPv4, and then sends the response back. Um, the nice thing about this um, is that your IPv4 network is still intact. Um, and you're using IPv6 to get out to the internet. Um, basically, it introduces a new path to the, to the internet. Um, there's no compromise with the IPv4 network, and there's really not a lot of ways to detect this today. So, um, you know, in terms of packets, what this looks like, and I know you can't see this in the back, so I'll just translate it for you. On the inside of the network, what you're seeing is IPv6 packets. Um, sent to that evil router, and then um, the evil router then translating those and sending those out to the internet as IPv4. Um, uh, the guidance to prevent this is simply to disable IPv6. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, right? Um, how many enterprise networks have IPv6 enabled? Probably most of them. Um, is there anybody here that's actually disabled IPv6 inside one network? Interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, let's skip ahead. Um, so, wireless evil twin. Um, this is another man in the middle technique. Uh, first one wireless that we'll talk about. Um, and really, what this is is you know setting up a rogue network um, so that uh, you know devices which can't discern between which wireless networks are available to them um, are automatically connecting in. Um, so, um, let's talk a little bit about how you might do this. Um, this is the Poem Pad. Um, how many people have heard of the Poem Pad? Most people? Awesome, cool. Um, let's do a demo with it. Um, so, um, if you haven't heard of the, the, the Poem Pad, basically what it is is a Nexus 7 um, with uh, an Android interface, but then also an Ubuntu Cheru. Um, and what it allows you to do is run security tools on the device. Uh, from the Android interface. So let me see if I can get us connected here.
So bear with me for just a second while I get disconnected. All right, live demos. Let's try this. Come on. All right, you guys see that okay? So basically what this is, this is a palm pad. Um, again, this image is freely available from our website. If you have a Nexus 7, you can go download it. Um, really, let's do this. Um, so there's evil twin attacks. What I'm going to do is hit this evil AP right here. It's a little bit slow, um, but we'll go ahead and give this a shot. There we go. Um, it's going to ask you which interface you want to connect on. So we'll say the internal network. Um, then it's going to ask us for an SSID. Um, it will allow us to spoof an SSID if we want. It's using Airbase on the back end, so um, basically it can respond to probe requests. Um, so give it a second to catch up here. So I'm going to switch it over to a different wireless network just to make it a little bit faster. Sorry about this.
Try this again. wireless connection give it an SSID um, we're going to turn off automatic probe request connections and there we go I'm going to start to get probe requests everybody has the wireless off yes all right cool there we go all right, sorry for the delay on that. Just wanted to get this up and going. Live demos are always fun. Uh, so, uh, let's connect with a client here. Um, so what you're seeing right now is uh, probe requests um, from clients. Um, and this thing is listening on ATT Wi-Fi, which by default, again, um, AT&T clients will automatically try and connect on. Um, we've had folks uh, run this during live demos and actually had connections um, from lots of uh, different folks. Okay, there we go, All right, already connected. Um, and what I'm going to do at this point is, now that I've got the actual connection listening, I'm going to go ahead and run um, strings watch just to see if we can see anything uh, come across. So select five, and we don't want to save the log. Go ahead and let that run. And you'll see almost immediately, um, we start getting traffic across. There we go. And I actually have a Kindle. This is a Kindle connecting in. So most of the traffic is actually encrypted, which is nice. Um, let's go ahead and go to a web page. There you go. And you can start to see some of the um, certificate strings. Again, this is, I mean, you can do a full TCP dump um, with this, but this is an easy way to... Uh, SSL strip on top of this. Is everybody familiar with SSL strip? Is anybody who's um, no? So SSL strip is um, released by Moxie Mullen Spike. I think it was 2009. Um, it's interesting. I didn't fully understand it until recently. Um, basically, what it's doing um, is 
stripping out um, HTTPS links in traffic that comes across. Um, and so if you make an initial connection over HTTP, um, it's going to it's going to strip out any HTTPS links, and it won't it won't redirect you to HTTPS. Um, so you're basically stuck on HTTP um, even when you enter credentials and things like that. Um, so let's do five here. There we go. So that's up and running. Um, and we can actually do a Actually, look at the log for SSL strips. See if we get any posts. Nice, thank you. Uh, so, Hang on, just bear with me for a second. There we go. And right. So we're still getting traffic coming in. Uh, let me try to get a Facebook on here. in a second if we can't actually get it going. Okay, 
so I'm restarting Evil AP. Running SSL strip. Go. It's already running. Okay, well, I'm having trouble connecting the Kindle into this device, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. If anybody wants a demo later, I'll give them to them. Great, thank you. Um, basically, Evil Twin Attack, pretty simple to pull off. Um, the pump pad itself uses Airbase. You can do this on any laptop. Um, and really, the benefit of doing something like this is that mobile phones um, and devices with, with wireless are pretty easy to fool into connecting to you. Um, how do you prevent it? You know, basically, it's user education. There's not a lot of good ways to prevent this today. Um, there we go. Um, again, there's not a lot of ways. Um, you can use radius, um, but there's also ways to, to attack radius. Um, you can use easy creds. It's probably the easiest way that I know um, in order to attack. Um, uh, radius servers. Again, if they're using stronger authentication, um, it's not such an issue, um, but it's definitely an issue if um, using Radius with Leap. Um, does mobile device management help? Not really, um, depending on how you set it up, right? You can actually specify that all your devices will automatically connect to a particular SSID, um, but again, if you don't set up um, authentication with that, pretty easy to spoof. Um, forced HTTP, um, is really just SSL strip, and so this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Bas basically, it rewrites links as HTTP, um, and then you know provides you with uh, uh, what looks like a secure site. Um, it's pretty easy to pull off. I mean, this is you know this is the long and short of running SSL strip. You forward traffic through your device. You run the daemon on the actual uh, system that's going to uh, strip traffic, and then you forward traffic to it. Um, how do you prevent SSL strip uh, attacks? Really, the server itself has to, the server and the browser have to agree that they're not going to um, uh, accept uh, you know, traffic over HTTP. And the way they do that is with an HSTS header. Um, Google's rolled this out on all their, all their properties in the last year. Um, you know, another way to prevent this is just um, you know, always browsing to HTTPS dot whatever. Um, you know, there's a series of other attacks. We're not going to spend any time on these just because we're short on time as it goes. Um, but these are all sort of semi-practical attacks with the exception of certificate abuse and BGP attacks. Um, so I'll go ahead and skip through these. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools out there to um, automate attacks like this. Um, some things you want to take a look at if you haven't already um, is DSNF, Ettercap, uh, Beef, um, easy creds. Um, Subterfuge is a relatively new one, um, but an automated, easy attack platform. Um, you know, I think the takeaways here that man in the middle is really an underrated attack vector in general. Um, you know, it's it's easier to target people local to you. Um, POS systems are specifically more vulnerable. Um, Dropboxes are providing a credible way to actually get in the middle of of networks. Um, and the phones specifically are, are very vulnerable. Are there any questions? Yeah. Okay, after this, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, any other questions? Evil Twin? Uh, oh, Evil AP or Evil Twin? Right, right, right. Basically what we were demoing here, right? The automatic connection into um, an access point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're, you're basically creating a twin of an access point. So if there's, you know, what is it here? Courtyard guest. So you can set it up as either a static courtyard guest and run it on a different channel. 
Um, or you can set it so that it responds to probe requests. Um, and, and when you get a probe request for whatever your home network is, you know, um, call it Gabe's G-Man uh, uh, network address, then you know this will respond and say, you know, this is, you know, I am a valid access point for you. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, please fill out feedback forms. They're available in the back. Cool. Thanks, guys.